me the book is now in its sixth print run i mean two of the hardbound which is carrying it's it's been it's now a uh, kind of backdated we wrote a new version of it and uh, the sixth uh, version of the book is available hmm? it's in hindi and in marathi and hopefully later in the year we'll have bengali telugu and malayalam versions of the book but uh, the point that i wanted to make is that look if you are intimidated then there will be people to intimidate you if you believe uh, you need to hold truth to power if you believe that you if you have the facts on your side opinions are 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 free nisha i don't like the color of your sari are you going to take me to court you know i've sort of defamed you in front of like 50 people okay take me to court so i feel like the defamation uh, the, the legal notices uh, was uh, more less like i dislike the color of your sari i mean if to extend the metaphor and more like i uh, dislike the fabric that you use for the fall of your sari i mean in its pettiness and it's in its uh, small mindedness but i get the point that you're making by in fact by making it more petty and more malicious and in in some way irrational it's ridiculous ridiculous you know, they actually sent a legal notice to a woman who scored on court crime was you know she was associated with an association with which i was associated with, with which i'm still associated i made a simple request i said why don't you send this invitation to the union mailing list so i mean sometimes they could ridiculous extend uh, to a uh, ridiculous extent you know, i'll give you another example of how uh, attempts to intimidate don't succeed uh, the press club in in mumbai had a discussion where the, the speakers included the former petroleum minister manish shankar ayer it's interesting how the media deals with these things in the course of his uh, presentation he made what i thought was you know manish shankar is famous for his one liners so he said i think it's about time the ministry of petroleum and natural gas should be renamed the ministry of reliance affairs so people were damn happy with that the press trust of india also reported it and that but of course it is in the penultimate paragraph of uh, a particular uh, of news report they put out uh, it was uh, published on the website of the economic times and and, and business standard but next day there were very few publications that even mentioned this the hall was jam packed well that's the way it is so i mean this brings us to this bigger problem of the power to control the money i mean how important is money power in ensuring that critical voices are stifled i think it's very very powerful the saving grace or the silver lining if you like is that such attempts succeed only up to a point okay um i i meant to i meant to refer to this earlier did you read the phrase chilling effect it's used in a very particular way that it's meant to make you feel cold and clammy and you know want to not leave your house uh, preferably your bed and have a blanket over your head but uh, on balanjoy and his co-authors it seems to have had a rather more modern and contemporary effect like chill as in like utterly chill you know uh, last year he wrote an uh, article about this uh, uh, beginning with lawsuit what lawsuit right so uh, i want to come back no, to it i want to say large numbers of people ask me what happened to the lawsuit and, and you know in sense i do seriously believe that the legal action that they took against me my co-authors my publisher my book distributor flipkart amazon had the had a negative effect it attracted more attention for instance uh, the times of india was most widely circulated english daily newspaper etc etc which account for half of all the english daily newspapers that are sold in this country uh, when the book was launched there was no mention in the paper but when they served a legal notice it was on page 1 yeah so uh, to go away from the the small minded petty and ridiculous parts of the story to actually the heart of the book uh, i wonder with the for the sake of the audience many of whom haven't read the book could 
you tell us a little bit about how you started and what are the major like you 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 say this thing about crony capitalism and that goes on as a theme in the next book as well in Sue the Messenger, uh, where you get a sort of a survey of uh, um, corporate interests affecting media coverage, but in choosing this particular in this particular uh, legal dispute this particular battle between the brothers um, you sort of make a slice to show how uh, what seems like the kind of family dispute everybody was you know eating popcorn and watching actually has a, a large um, it has a large prism through which we can see how the government functions, how the state functions, how it affects our uh, interests as public interests, all of these things. So I wondered for the sake of the audience whether you would just uh, recap a little bit of what the, the claim right. of the book, this book is. Uh, this is a tough call to try and summarize in a couple of minutes. Uh, what has taken me and my co-authors about 600 pages and four and a half years to put together. Be that as it may, let me try clever sound bites, one-liners. What I argue in the book and what we've argued in the book is that the real reason why Mukesh Bhai and Anil Bhai fell out with each other and partitioned their father's empire uh, actually had perhaps very little to do with the fact that Tina and Nita didn't exactly get along with each other. Uh, that could have been a reason, undoubtedly. I've sought to argue in the book that the most important reason why the brothers fought, and they, they of course subsequently patched up, was access to natural resources. That's gas, natural gas, from the Krishna Godavari Basin. This is a natural resource which is supposed to belong to the people of this country. It's not even uh, the government. I mean, there's more than one Supreme Court judgment which says that these are natural resources that belong to the people of this country. The problem arises is when the government, as the representative of the people of this country, fails to act as an honest, transparent, fair, and balanced custodian or trustee of resources that belong to the people of this country. So that was essentially, uh, in my opinion, the reason why this book, uh, uh, this is the focus of the book. The second point I wanted to make is that, you know, much of the book, when it was published in uh, April 2014, it's it's kind of almost uh, three years ago. Um, I I would say about seventy five percent of this book was information in the public domain. You know, reports of government committees and and reports in newspapers, reports in magazines. So I was merely the cut and paste guy. You know, I was compiling information, except that I tried to compile that information in a manner in which it was readable. But yes, there, there was 25% of the book which was new. There was an exclusive interview with the late Subir Draha, former head of the Oil and Natural Gas Commission, he had given to me. He passed away uh, soon after, while the book was being published. Th there's an exclusive bit, once again, concerning the former Minister of State for Petroleum and Natural Gas, Mani Shankar Ayer. Uh, and uh, he, at a closed door meeting, uh, in, you know, they, they have something called these Chatham House rules where people speak and they're not to be attributed. Uh, so at one point of time, when he... That's correct, that's correct. So there was a place, uh, it was at the India International Center in Delhi, where at a meeting of quite a few people, Mr. Manisha Karayar, uh, you know, he, he talked about how the price of gas was being the administered, the officially administered price of gas was being sought to be increased from $2.34 per unit to $4.20 per unit. Now, he was no longer the petroleum minister. Uh, he was succeeded by the late Murli Deora. But one quip he made was fabulous. He's, uh, when he said the pressures that were being put on the government to increase the price of gas from 2.34 to 4.20, he says everybody 
nobody in India knows what 420 is all about. So, I mean, so these were some of the snippets of information, bits and pieces of information, which were not in the public domain. But once again, let me assure you that well over three fourths of what was published was material in the public domain. I have to quarrel with you on the unnecessary modesty there. But uh, I want to ask you this figure in the early book about the extent of loss that even within state, even what the government was uh, estimating is uh, 32,000 crores. Is, is that the. No, that was one of many. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, I'll tell you how these things work. You can ask me how I got a text of what Mr. Manishankar Iyer said at that meeting. Mm. And there will be no prizes given to you to guess correctly. Uh, I give a blow by blow account of what happened when Mr. Jaipal Reddy heard that he was being kicked upstairs from Minister of Petroleum, Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas to Minister of Science and Technology. Mm. I say that he got a phone call from Ahmed Patel and uh, Said Sonia Gandhi wants this. So, again, we'll, I will give you no prizes for guessing how I got this information. What is the journalistic techniques? What one is reasonably sure of the authenticity of the information, you just go ahead with it. But what actually happened was within the government, and mind you, this is all the UPA government, this is all the last years of the UPA government, the government was split down the middle. The cabinet committee on economic affairs was just split down the middle on whether or not the price of gas was to be increased. And thanks to the casting vote of the former Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, they decided to go ahead. But they couldn't implement it because the Election Commission intervened. Actually, that's where the first edition of the book ends in March 2014. The new edition of the book uh, uh, includes the uh, developments that took place for about a year and a half after that, or almost two years after that. So, uh, the, the question is there any specific point you so want to highlight? I, I wonder so when you started, I mean, you worked with estimates like 32,000 crores. Uh, yeah. oh, okay, okay. Estimates. You know, these are not all estimates, these are also guesstimates. Uh, you know, these were notional figures, you know, uh, Rai, former controller and auditor general of India also uh, uh, came across these estimates. The point is all these estimates or guesstimates are based on official documents. They were not written by me, but they came up, these are reports of the controller and auditor general of India. I'll give you one example. These, this is something called gold plating. If you don't have a proper My favorite phrase from this book, yeah. Gold plating. I mean, it's like how how do you artificially increase the price of equipment that you're buying? It's like you say you, you make the toilet where the taps are gold plated kind of thing. Why? Because you have no disincentive. There are no penalties if you don't spend money. Because the government is going to compensate you for everything. You know, it's the same thing. It's like if you take gas and, and how, how you take that gas out. So this is what the CAG pointed out. I mean, you can be drinking water. You can be having a plastic cup or you can be drinking water out of a, a paper cup or you can be drinking out of a glass glass or you could have a gold-plated goblet. You still be drinking water. So that was the point, and this is not me again, but the controller and auditor general, which showed how the government turned a blind eye to these kind of cost escalations, and how they chose to literally look the other way. How the production sharing contract was working against the interests of the majority of the people of this country to benefit a privileged few. I think uh, the best picture of the gold plating, which is of uh, people uh, in the parties involved here, marking up and claiming much larger costs so that they can in turn pass it on uh, to the uh, to the government, which would in turn be passed on as a loss to us, the public. I think the best example and the best picture of it is painted when uh, Panjoy talks about going out to uh, the Godavari base, to the dig where the, uh, the drilling is happening. And could you talk a little bit of the general splendor 
of of the place no, that you visited while the book was being written uh they got to know i was writing the book which is not not surprising at all so uh through my friends in the media they got to know of course my friends in the media are my great friends in case you didn't know uh, the media is often its own worst enemy but that's another story uh so what happened is they told me why don't you come and see this place i said i'd love to he said we'll make the arrangements you know we'll buy the the your air ticket we we'll put you up in a in a nice guest house etc etc i said i'll go go on only one condition that i pay for my expenses i said i won't be cussed if you offer me a cup of tea or you give me give me some sandwich or the tomato sandwiches that That's you right. you praise the, highly the, the, the <laughs> fried fish <laughs> it was a spectacular experience I, mean, i could i mean it was an experience of a lifetime this is in the middle of the bay of bengal that you said yeah. absolutely correct absolutely correct so i i learned a lot and i must say uh senior officials of reliance industries limited did spend a lot of time in answering the questions that had been raised by the controller and auditor general of india successive parliamentary committees and so on and so forth and and I, and I, all that is given in great detail the only thing I, i i at the end of it all i say there is another part to that story this is one side and there is another side so i think that's where uh one of the reasons why uh, they didn't move court because their version was given in full i don't know i mean recorded therefore did you send that contract what contract it says that you yes, yes, i i sent him let's say i'm wondering if this is something which i could would work against me so, so don't i will quickly uh, huh? no no it's worth it it's worth it i'll tell you what okay i'll, I'll tell you I'll, 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 Dispute between you. Okay, I I, I, I read it and I read it 
it again and then I read it again and, I, and then you know project continues to go on and then he comes back later on with someone else commenting that nobody mother should be involved in settling this dispute and perhaps the Supreme Court should get involved and this is how he uh, um, indulges his uh, taste for the ridiculous that is throughout this book. The thing that I, I want to ask you is this phrase SLAPP, uh, strategic uh, legal action against, strategic litigation against public participation. It's an internationally used phrase. It seems to have had the opposite effect on you. I, you are probably I, I'm, participating. I'm, I'm honored and privileged. <laughs> but there are many people who haven't been. Right. In Hamish McDonald's book on polyester, uh, all the polyester prints, he couldn't publish it and print it and distribute it in this country. I mean, he, he just couldn't. I mean, the point is, when the brothers were fighting and there was another story happening, suddenly, in, 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 the, in, in the pavements of Mumbai and Delhi and, and, and Kolkata, you were finding these little photocopied versions of the book available. I mean, I mean is it the, the same story gets uh, told all over again? In, in the case of uh, Subhutu Roy uh, and Tamal Bandhupad, the same thing he went to Kolkata High Court, he delayed the publication of, of uh, the story of uh, the Sahara Group. And, and I mean, there are innumerable examples. Josie Joseph's example has happened. Uh, yes, uh, if, if you look at one of the rare cases where the law has worked against the writer and against the large corporate entity, was when the Bombay High Court ruled in favor of Sucheta Dalal and Money Life and against the National Stock Exchange and actually directed the National Stock Exchange to pay a certain amount of money in the form of damages to a, a, a charitable cause to, to, to a hospital. That's wonderful. Yeah, but, but, but the point is they have challenged that judgment. Right. So, so they are still where they are. So the, the point is across the world and also in India, litigation is expensive. When you are smart lawyers and clever lawyers, you can drag this thing all over again. I mean, take the case of Jitendra Bhargav and the descent of Air India. I mean, he is a former top official of Air India and he has documented uh, what, according to him, is the reason why Air India is in, in the kind of financial mess it is at present. The then civil aviation minister, Praful Patel, took him to court. It dragged on and on and on. So, I mean, there are innumerable such examples. Like the case of an organization called Crop Care Federation of India. It's, it's kind of headed by an organization called United for Phosphorus, headed by a person called Raju, Raju Shroff. I mean, anybody and everybody who has written anything against the use of pesticides have faced a legal notice against him. So, uh, right from... Uh, the Center for Science and Environment, uh, Sunita Narayan, and to many, many others. You see, the point is, and, and this is this, uh, a bit of the sad part of the story, the Supreme Court, um, Justice Deepak Mishra, he's kind of put the right to reputation uh, at more or less the same level as the right to free expression. Now, it's how you want to interpret this particular judgment, but that's one way of looking at it, that Justice Deepak Mishra has argued that the right to reparation, at least you can interpret, is as important as the right to free expression. Article 191A of the Constitution of India, and, and the big problem is really uh, how you interpret 192, which is a reasonable restriction on the right to free expression. So who, who decides what is a reasonable restriction? Is it your uh, local cop? Uh, is it your local mafia don? Or, or is it the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India? So that's one part of the story. But the, the thing about these, uh, what the commission of judgment was all about, there was an attempt, uh, a petition was moved, I, I was willingly involved in it too, saying that decriminalized defamation. In India, defamation is both civil offense and criminal offense. What we argue is that across the world, across the world, in most countries of the world, defamation is not a criminal offense. I mean, today, if somebody 
it says you have to think theoretically the judge can walk behind bars theoretically whether it happens or not is depends on the judge of course and i mean there have been cases where the media has been wary of taking on taking on the judiciary i mean there's the cases midday versus the former chief justice of india just a simple one why they brought out a whole set of stories about how his sons were involved in uh, real estate deals so so the thing is about defamation and how it is treated by the law this is hugely problematic in this country so i have an extremely short question and after that we're going to go into a uh, question and answers from the audience i feel um, mildly superstitious as i'm saying this but i feel the success of this book the fact that you're not in jail um uh, the fact that uh, you have had six six editions and it's going into other languages it feels six, uh, two editions six print runs six print runs sorry um it feels uh, talismanic it feels uh, hopeful um the question that i have is in a career of 40 years across it's, media it's going to be 40 yeah, me uh, yes. do you have a talisman that will work for you something that you hold up in on a dark day oh my god that's <laughs> a really tough question <laughs> think of this after a while the audience thinks of that as a, as a practicing atheist i believe that and as a person who sort of a, has suffered uh, more than one uh, real near death experience i i do believe that as you move uh, along as you move up the economic and social ladder all of us must remember to be very polite and very nice to everybody you meet on that way why 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 because the same much of people you'll meet on your way down it's like on that odd like emily post meets karl marx no okay like karl marx miss miss tanners karl marx our honorable minister of state for water resources ms uma bharti is firmly of the view that narendra modi is more marxist than karl marx so on that miss matters and uh, uma bharti not very very boring uh, we can now ask questions yeah so uh, and uh, my name is navratan addiction is did your thoughts research in book had any influence on uh, the country saving a lot of the other natural resources over this spectrum to more water and sun uh, if it did then this book is more than what we got did the uh, impact did the book i, I don't give, i don't give myself that kind of credit i also don't give the book that kind of credit i think a large number of people in this country certainly and across the world have been shouting themselves hoarse about the opaque the non transparent the the absolutely arbitrary manner in which natural resources have been allotted and priced whether it be telecommunication spectrum your famous uji spectrum scam which is still playing out in the courts whether it be natural gas whether it be coal gate uh, the allotment of coal uh, whether it be close of home yes no gandhi janata reddy and why is jagannath uh, Jag- i mean uh, why is jagan mohan reddy i mean the way i know resources that belong not just to this generation of people but future generations of people were literally looted so it was not just a devastation of the environment that took place you actually depleted a natural resource which belongs to future generations so so i'm i'm, I'm saying that there is greater awareness if i've been able to uh, contribute to that discourse i'm truly happy and honored uh, and, and there has been i mean take the cag take the courts of law in certain respects they have indeed been more proactive i mean take, take the land acquisition law i mean, I mean the attempts that were made to make it quote unquote more business friendly and finally the fact that uh, they had to give up amending the land acquisition law also speaks uh, also informs you that you know uh, it's become uh, I, 
I mean, it is important that uh, there be more concerted uh, public attempts to prevent this kind of misuse, mispricing, misallocation of natural resources. But you can say, yes, you worked up to a certain point of time. Maybe it hasn't worked. I mean, uh, Gali Janathan Reddy was put behind bars in 2011. He was there for three years. You know what happened to his daughter's birthday also. I mean, everybody knows. Uh, not, not birthday, wedding. I, I, I stand corrected. So, you know, well, whether it made a difference, those three years in jail, I don't know. Uh, talking of uh, public efforts to stop such things, I think one of my uh, favorite things, but not Miss Manners' favorite things, I'm positive, uh, was um, around the land acquisition bill, uh, like young activists in Jharkhand, Adivasi activists in Jharkhand, printed out copies of the land acquisition bill, stood in front of, uh, well, sat in front of a government office and uh, defecated on the bill as a, as a greatest natural expression. <laughs> Uh, so, you had a question? Uh, I was wondering whether, uh, uh, as a follow-up, uh, you would like to comment on uh, what happened fairly recently, maybe last year, on ONGC bailing out the Gujarat State uh, Petroleum Corporation. Uh, I don't know all the facts, but I think this so is I can point. give the facts to you. The facts are also in the public domain. Uh, ONGC has agreed to, uh, it hasn't yet happened, to pick up 80% of this Gujarat government company. Many people, whether rightly or wrongly, perceive as, as a company that was very actively promoted. When Narendra Modi was the Prime Minister, uh, sorry, the Chief Minister of Gujarat, <coughs> some of us tried lobbying against it. And uh, there's a lot of information in the public domain. I can just give you one example. Uh, when I wrote an article on the subject, I sent a detailed questionnaire to the chairman and the managing director of this company. They were both senior IAS officers in the Gujarat government. The managing director sent a detailed response saying that it's not an official response from me at MD, but this is the, <coughs> you can attribute it to a spokesperson of the company, which is fine. I had about 17 or 18 questions, or 16 or 18 questions. What to me was significant was the questions that were not answered. And these questions pertained to the quote unquote undue gains the GSPC gave to the Adani Group companies and the Amani Group companies. There's a lot of information in the public domain. I, I, I mean, people like me, and I was not alone. I mean, even Jairam remains from a series of pieces in the Hindu. It didn't make a difference. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's still time, but whether it will make a difference, I don't know. But uh, maybe uh, if there's more opposition, it could make a difference. But in my opinion, and there's something coming up very, very recently, I just come up on our website. In my opinion, this is a complete uh, case. I mean, it is a classic case of crony capitalism, except that it uh, concerns a state government company, a Gujarat government company, and one of India's, if not India's biggest, certainly one of India's biggest public sector corporations, the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation. 80% of ONGC is held by the government. Uh, is held by you and me, that is, literally. Uh, but I, I regret to inform you that the government is bailing out this company and literally at the end of the day, uh, 30,000 crores is involved. 30,000 crores involved. I mean, I mean, so why isn't this, because, you know, to it so, sorry, sir, we're, we're running out of time. So I can take one question and then I'll be like,
like rocket ejected. Oh, I will I be rocket answer. ejected from the seat soon after. Is it okay if there is a woman in the audience who wants to ask a question? <laughs> I will take her. If there is a woman in the audience who wants to ask a question, else so you can take the question. What was the threat to my life? I had no threat to my life. <laughs> oh, that was because of uh, uh, myocardial infarction, uh, also known as a heart attack, 16 years ago. Uh, and it was largely on account of my, of my terrible lifestyle. It was largely on, uh, yeah, uh, it's largely on account of my uh, not listening to everybody who was considered uh, to themselves to be my well-wisher. And because at one stage I almost became a multiple drug abuser, uh, abusing uh, narcotics, nicotine and alcohol. I didn't take anybody's advice. At, Forget at my this point, if you had lied, I, I wish you had lied and said it was a speed car chase involving several oil trucks. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll, I'll make one comment. When I made this documentary film on uh, the iron ore mining in Bellari and Anadapur, and I have a few copies also available for you here. Everybody asked me this question. Why weren't you scared? I said, look, it was easier for me sitting in Delhi to make the film that if I was in Bangalore, those guys were far more scared. I was a parachute journalist. You know, I was a helicopter journalist. I would come and go. I didn't understand Kannada. I didn't understand Telugu. But the point is, you are intimidated if you choose to be intimidated. Also, we try and devise our own insurance policies. It's when you report from a conflict zone. There's no guarantee that you won't be bumped off. But you can take some precautions. So one of the precautions I took is while I just began making this film, I met a, 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 a person who was senior to me in college, uh, who was then a big gun in the government. Uh, I said, I'm making this film. And it's going to go against your boss. And he might again become your boss, that is Mr. Yedurappa. Uh, so he says, don't worry. I said, do make sure my children are not kidnapped. And uh, he, on a slip of paper, tell, gave these two names. And he says, go, go to them. They'll help you. So we also have to, you know, I would let everybody I would meet while making the film. They would ask me the same question. Are you scared? Are you scared? I said, you please write. Please write in your paper, write in your magazine or whatever, that I don't want my children to be kidnapped. Thank you, Panjoy, and thank you, thank you the audience. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much for having me.